So now to tonight's event. Um, it gives me great pleasure to hand over to our chair for this evening, Dr. Peter Werthers. Peter is a teaching fellow at the University of Cambridge and was the judge of this year's Take One video competition and is also a member of the Organic Division Council. Aside from lecturing, Peter is involved in a number of uh, projects bridging the transition between sixth form and university. He's also heavily involved in promoting chemistry to uh, the general public and to young students. Um, he's received a number of awards for outreach activities and educational activities, so now it's with great pleasure that I hand over to Peter and invite him to introduce tonight's lecture. <clears throat> Oh, thank you very much. Um, it is indeed a pleasure to be here this evening to, to chair this event. Uh, as someone who has played, uh, uh, participated in quite a bit of outreach in the past, I was absolutely delighted to be one of the judges for this, uh, for this uh, competition. But um, essentially, as a member of the Organic Division Council of the Royal Society of Chemistry that I was selected to do this. Um, and now, as some of you may already know, the uh, RSC divisions, interest groups, and local sections uh, play an important role in supporting the scientific research community in contributing to its full potential uh, in advancing the chemical sciences. The organic division uh, aim to encourage and promote advances in the field of organic chemistry, interpreted in its very broadest sense, through activities to inspire the next generation of chemists and through prizes and awards, conferences and events that provide opportunities for our community to share ideas and collaborate. With the growing need for scientists to communicate their research effectively outside of an academic setting, the Organic Division initiated the Take One video competition in 2013. The idea was to ask young researchers to make a one-minute video about an area of chemistry they're fascinated by and to tell us why it's important to human health. The videos aimed to inspire the next generation to embrace the chemical sciences, as well as to highlight the numerous opportunities that chemistry provides to improve our lives. Following the success of the competition in 2013, we organised it for a second year in 2015, and the Organic Division were delighted with the high quality of the entries that were received. The selection committee had a pretty difficult job, actually, to select the finalists, but five excellent videos were shortlisted for voting by the RSC members and by members of the public uh, for them to pick their favourite. The videos were novel and gave an insight into some exciting areas of research, featuring the application of nanochemistry to drug delivery, the chemistry of fat cells, hearing how researchers are tackling antibiotic resistance, the chemistry of toothpaste, and the possibility of generating biological antifreezes to realise long-term blood and organ storage in the future. The videos are still available online, so please log in and have a look if you haven't already done so. Almost 2,000 votes were cast, and tonight I'm delighted that we're joined uh, by two of the uh, finalists uh, to expand with their presentations. So first up is Matthew Coleman, and Matthew uh, won the first prize in the 2015 Take One video competition uh, for his video entitled Nanoparticles as Drug Delivery Couriers. And uh, Matthew's entry was inspired by his final year research project where he investigated the synthesis and functionalization of silicon nanoparticles for applications in drug delivery and vaccine development. Matthew's just finish, uh, finished his undergraduate study at University College Dublin, and I actually believe he's got to fly back uh, tomorrow morning in order to graduate, which is all very exciting. Uh, and he's just returned from uh, travelling uh, before trying to save up to continue with a master's degree in chemistry later this year. So, thank you very much. We'll hand over to, to Matthew. Thank you. Thanks a million, Pete, for that introduction. Um, yeah, it'll be an early, early morning flight tomorrow, but uh, graduating tomorrow should be fun. Um, so first of all, I'd like to thank the... OSC uh, for inviting me here to London to speak, in particular Kari for uh, flying me over here from Dublin. Um, I was absolutely delighted to have been shortlisted in the competition, especially among such uh, great other entries, uh, including Franz here as well. Um, yeah, I'm very grateful to have won, and uh, I must admit that when I saw the email with the competition in January, 
I thought to myself, 60 seconds of video explaining my research, that shouldn't be too, that shouldn't be too much of a problem. But uh, it turned out that it's actually quite a difficult exercise, especially when you're in the thick of doing a 40 page thesis. Um, so yeah, I'll touch back on that a little toward, more towards the end. Um, but tonight I'm going to give you an insight into some of the research that I did over the course of the year in the Centre for Bio Nano Interactions in uh, University College Dublin. Um, unfortunately, as about two days ago, my supervisor emailed me saying that I couldn't disclose some of the finer details of the project because of a published publication which is in the making at the moment. So I know this is being videoed, so hopefully he doesn't see and hopefully I don't slip up on any details. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm still going to cover the, the general concepts, concepts nonetheless. Okay, so yeah, I was, uh, I was assigned a research project in the CBNI um, as part of my final year graduate, uh, undergraduate degree in chemistry. Uh, the project made up about 20 credits of our final year, um, involved making a thesis, doing presentations, and over 300 plus hours of lab work. Um, but it did fl flew by, and um, to be honest, the lab work provided a nice escape from the torture of lectures. Um, especially the theory involved at times, quantum mechanics can be quite rough. Um, and so, what does the group do? So, the group has about 50 researchers in it from all over the world, specialists in the area of nano nanochemistry. Um, it's led by Director Professor Kenneth Dawson, and their principal field of research is nanomedicine. So, that is the use of nanotechnology for medical and biomedical applications. Um, to put it in very simple terms, they are studying how nanoparticles interact with living organisms. Um, together, they've published uh, hundreds of papers in the likes of na Nature Nanotechnology, Chemical Communications, and RSC Advances. And they are advancing and pioneering many of the techniques uh, to advance the field. So these are, this is the cycle of research themes that the group is involved with. Um, you've got ranging from na novel nanoparticle synthesis, functionalization and dispersion, which is the project that I was involved with, all the way through to live cell imaging of the nanoparticles inside cells and tissues, um, through to how they interact with the brain, and then through to um, their impact on uh, the environment and toxicology studies. Um, the centre provides a multidisciplinary platform for studying how nanoparticles and nanomaterials interact with living things. So let's just back up for a second. I know I've thrown around that word nanoparticles and nanomaterials. You're probably wondering what are those. If you don't know, they're basically uh, clusters of atoms or molecules that are bonded together in such a way that they form a shape. For example, spheres or cubes or rods. And they form this, these shapes in the size range of nanometers. And that's in between. So that's, to give you some scale, that's about a thousand times smaller than a human cell. Um, it's a billionth of a meter or a millionth of a millimeter. Um, they also importantly are of a similar size to viruses, albeit a bit smaller, which is significant for how we can exploit them um, uh, for medical applications. And so that brings me on to why we're so interested in them. Okay, so as you get to the nanoscale, you start to develop new properties and functions. Um, graphene is probably a nanomaterial that you've all heard of. It's got all the superlatives to its name. It's the strongest, lightest, and most electrically conductible nanomaterial that the, the Earth has seen so far. Um, but more importantly for us in the CBNI with biological and medical applications, um, there are two things that make nanoparticles so exciting for us, and that is their size and their surface. So their tiny size, um, the tiny size of these particles allow them to uniquely gain access to and operate in the cell, all around parts of the body and, and in the brain. So as, well as a con so as a consequence to their small size, the, um, the ratio of surface atoms to those in the bulk increases significantly as you get down to the nanoscale. So that makes, uh, that makes the surface very chemically reactive, so we can modify and add things to the surface, such as antibodies, drugs, proteins. 
Okay. So because we're able to modify the surface so easily, and they're so small, it enables fascinating applications for medicine. The most obvious being smart drugs. Smart drugs being drugs that we can deliver localized treatment to, um, to a direct target site. Uh, other applications include gene therapy, tumor destruction via heating, and disease diagnostics. At the moment, it is a lack of detailed mechanistic information, as well as uh, controlling the surface chemistry at such a, at such a small level uh, that provides, that, that presents the biggest challenges for us in nanomedicine today. Okay, so getting to my research project, exactly what we were doing. Um, my thesis was entitled Pattern Surface Functionalization of Silica Nanoparticles. So you know what nanoparticles are now? We were using silica. Um, and basically, the objective of my research project was to investigate and optimize a novel multi-step approach to functionalizing the surface of silica nanoparticles. I know that sounds like a bit of a mouthful, but um, why did we want to do this? So the way a nanoparticle interacts when it's subjected in a bi biological environment, um, the way it interacts is a result of the arrangement of proteins on the surface of the particle. If we could arrange the surface chemistry on the particle by adding functional groups to certain areas, then we would later be able to attach the targeting, targeting proteins in a very controlled way. And this has never been done before. It's all, it's only ever been, they've only ever been attached very randomly. So we want to achieve defined patterns. And so by controlling the spatial locations where these proteins attach on the surface, we provide the particle with, I guess, a kind of GPS route map to navigating through the body, getting it to exactly where we want it to go. So that's obviously very important for applications in targeted drug delivery and other ones like I mentioned earlier. There's something in nature, however, that already that we can gain inspiration from and that already exists and does this very effectively, and that is viruses. So there's some pictures of some viruses now with some common surface characteristics. You can see these spiky things coming out are proteins. And um, sorry, um, yes. So we probably we've most of us here will have had a virus at some point in our lives. Everyone's had a common cold, influ influenza. These all these are viruses. And so we know firsthand how easily these guys can, can, can infiltrate our defenses and weave their way around our body. Um, a pattern protein coat called the capsid and the virus envelope, that's these guys here, um, make up the surface of the, of the virus. And it's these surface features that enable them to so effectively attach to and enter our cells. They've mastered the process of evolving their surface proteins to target cellular receptors. And so looking to viruses as a kind of model, we aim to achieve similar patterns of surface functionalization using a multi-step approach in, our project, in my project. So this might then provide increased control over the surface chemistry possible, and then lead to applications such as novel vaccine development and targeted drug delivery. OK, so when a nanoparticle enters a biological environment, it is surrounded with so much different uh, biological machinery that it attracts proteins, lipids, and sugars onto the surface. We call this layer of proteins and stuff absorbed onto the surface, we call this the corona. And it's this layer of biomolecules that becomes the biological identity for the particle within the cell. To that end, it holds the fate of the transport of the particle in terms of cellular uptake, trafficking pathway, and subcellular localization. And we think that by in increased control of the surface chemistry, we can better control the corona that forms and thus follow the correct biological pathway. And when we fail, even with failures, we understand more on the mechanisms involved, and so there's no real losing in this field. Only a, only a greater understanding is reached of the interactions at play. So this is the approach, the four steps that we had for the project. It started off with synthesizing particles, 
four particles of silica that were about 80 nanometers in diameter. We then adsorbed smaller masking particles to create a template by blocking off the surface of those silica particles. We did this with different shapes, rods and, and uh, spheres like you can see. So then after that, functionalized them to the surface by coding functional groups. We tried using amines and thiols onto the surface around the template. And then following that, removing, selectively removing that template in order to leave free silica space um, for attachment of other things such as drugs, uh, proteins, for, for example. And so hopefully achieving similar surface patterns to the virus and a better arrangement of surface chemistry we can lead, will lead us to applications, like I mentioned earlier, in novel vaccine development and targeted drug delivery. It was important while we had this approach to investigate the best conditions necessary for each individual step before finally applying the complete functionalization approach and testing the success, its success as a whole. So how did we create the template? Well, the masking particles are on the surface are positively charged. And so they electric, ele electrostatically absorb and are attracted to negatively charged core particles. A similar self-assembly had been seen before on a larger scale by Sadowska et al., which you can see in the picture here. But they did this on a much larger scale. So those core particles are about 800 nanometers, while the masking particles creating the template are about 80 nanometers. And so we wanted to see whether we could achieve these kind of patterns but on about 100 times smaller scale. So we ran experiments to investigate the best conditions by varying pH, ionic strength, and particle concentrations um, in order to characterize the assemblies achieved again and again and to optimize this step as much as these steps as much as possible. So this was actually a big task in itself, and uh, it became an entire thesis for one of my colleagues, Emma Carroll, um, which we inter which we communicated with during the project. So I gained information from her and likewise her from me. Um, so now that we had a protocol for creating a template on the surface uh, of silica, we wanted to investigate the type of functional groups that would work best um, for coding the silica surface around the template. Um, silica presented an excellent scaffold on which versatile siloxane chemistry is possible. And so Siloxanes with exposed amines and thiol groups were used um, to investigate the, which one would work best. Um, both of these siloxane molecules are able to undergo further bioconjugation reactions. So when it comes down to it, we can further bioconjugate things like proteins, drugs, etc., onto the surface. These siloxanes react to form strong covalent bonds on the surface, and tests were done to investigate the influence of the following acid treatment step, which would be used to remove the template, and how that would interact, and how that would interfere with, if at all, with the functionalized surface. And so we found that using amines worked best and was least interfered with by the acid treatment step. So we went ahead and we used amines as the functional groups to add to the surface. So following that then, we needed to remove the, the masking template that we left on the surface. We did that using acid, hydrochloric acid. Um, optimizing the conditions for this step were optimized so as to ensure complete dissolution of the template, but meanwhile trying not to degrade the amine functionalized surface during the step. And so that's the four step approach kind of finished then how did we measure the success, whether it worked or not? Um, well, this brings me back to uh, my supervisor letting me know that I can't disclose too much of the information. But um, basically, we gained inspiration from a colleague whose paper um, involved some of these images down here. And it uh, was basically about protein labeling. And so we used... Um, we use labels to attach to bond to the functionalized surface. Um, and so being able to visualize then under uh, transition, transmission electron microscopy, you could then visualize what functional groups were on the surface and whether a template or a pattern was created. 
And so these, this, these images ideally are what we would like to have seen. The one on the right is what we would like to have seen. So the one on the left would be the approach without the pattern the creating the template step. If you had left that out, that's what the surface would look like because you've got functional groups all over it. Whereas if we had included the step um, and created the pattern, then you would be left with something on the right like here with patches of uh, patterned unfunctionalized surface with which we can then add drugs to. So future work, I'm now finished researching in the, in the, in the, the project and uh, as of the summer. And so the next stage I'm told by my supervisor is to further optimize the approach by achieving more uniform templates. Um, so getting the masking particles to arrange exactly how we want them to. Um, continued efforts with the research could lead to applications in targeted drug delivery and novel vaccine development like I mentioned before. And so just finally then, I guess um, it's, it's, kind of e it's kind of easy when you're doing such an in-depth research project to kind of get blindsided by the bigger picture. And you can very easily lose sight of the bigger picture. And so just to conclude, I guess, entering this competition um, was a fantastic opportunity to show the bigger picture in a creative and exciting way. Um, it was a fantastic competition to be a part of, and I wish it every success in the future. Um, and so thank you for listening, and I hope I gave you some insight into the research area that I was in, and some of the amazing applications that nanomedicine will present for society in the future. Thank you. Um, so I wonder if we have any questions for Matthew then on his presentation there. Feel free not to ask. <laughs> uh, actually, can we use the microphone so it'll come out on the uh, recording as well, please? Hello. Uh, hi. I wonder if you could say a bit about um, how you control the shape and size of the nanoparticles when they're being made, and secondly, and independently, um, why it is that when they're in the body they don't get um, degraded. So why doesn't the body pick up that this is a, an alien? Sure. Yeah. So that's one of the things nanoparticles, trying to get them to evade the immune response while they're in the blood is one of the things. And so attaching some proteins to the surface in order to evade them is definitely one of the things that we look at. Um, actually, there was a research article that I read up on, and uh, they discovered that um, rods, the shapes of rods, actually evade the phagocytes, which are like immune res defense response cells um, to invading foreign bodies, essentially. And so they found out that rods better evade the immune system than spheres. And then, as your earlier question, how do we control the shape when we're making them? Well, the silica particles that we use followed the Lemur model. Now, that's going to mean nothing to you guys, but basically, you control the conditions like the temperature, the pH, um, in, and you control the conditions in order to produce particles that you know will become what shape they will become. Um, yeah. So. Any more questions? Uh, yes, the lady. Oh, sorry. There appears to be some concern about what happens to these nanoparticles in the body. Yeah. I read various articles about them accumulating in different organs, and I wonder yeah. whether you had anything to say how these are excreted totally yeah. from the body. I don't know the exact biology behind how they are excreted, um, even if they are, which they would want to be. Um, um, I know nanotoxicology is something that the, the group do research. Um, obviously, it's of utmost importance that when we're using nanoparticles as a drug delivery mechanisms, etc., that you need to have them to be safe. They need to be extruded from the body. I think silica is quite a, a non-invasive uh, material to use that it is um, excreted well in the body, but I don't know exactly how. Yeah. Are safe. Another question. Thank you for a very interesting lecture, but also Thank for you. a very interesting one minute. Um, yeah. 
I don't I, know how many of you saw the video, but I, I, I have, and a, a, wor a worthy winner. Thank you. Excellent shortlist. Um, I wondered how getting to your minute yeah. um, worked. Um, how did you structure that particular project? Because it's um, yeah quite a feat. To exactly. To yeah, something. especially like I mentioned earlier, when you're doing a 40-page thesis. <laughs> It's very easy to stay convoluted in how you're explaining things. And so, yeah, to get it to as succinct as a 60 second video definitely was difficult. Um, so I started off writing script. Um, it was probably like four or five pages with what I wanted to try and describe. But um, it's funny, it ended up coming down to 60 seconds. It was like, it literally went from four pages to four small paragraphs. Um, and so when you're reading that out slowly, it's like absolutely nothing when you see it down on paper. Um, so yeah, it was just literally cutting down, focusing with people in my family, so they know nothing about the area, so they were able to say, you know, what's that, well, what are you trying to, so you were forced to describe succinctly exactly what you were trying to explain. And so yeah, I think having, I don't want to call them dummies, but someone who is not uh, too involved in, in, in the area, or they don't know too much about the area, that definitely helps, yeah. Just a supplementary, what are you going to do your masters on? Uh, I don't know, I've always been interested in business, so mixing the business and, and chemistry potentially together might be an opportunity, but uh, that won't be for a while, so I'll have to see where life takes me before then, whether I want to do it in a different area altogether. Yeah. Any more questions? Um. Yeah. Just wondering, how far away do you think we are from actually having these like nanoparticles that are going to be potential drugs? Or yeah, so there's al there, there is already applications that are there. So you've got them at the various different stages. There's some being used at the moment. Um, for example, in contrast agents for MRI imaging um, provides better better uh, when you're injected in order to detect tumorous cells. So getting nanoparticles to them can highlight those more effectively in MRIs. Um, there's still so much in the pipeline now with all the research being done um, in terms of clinical trials and stuff. Yeah, I'd say it really will be in the near future that you'll start to see these things coming into action. Yeah. I have, I have two questions. Sure. Uh, nice easy ones. Um, so were you actually using um, solid silica particles for this model rather than ones that are you can encapsulate things in at this point? Solid, yeah, so we would be attaching things to the surface as opposed to there are other types of particles that you can actually encapsulate a drug inside it and then it releases it, kind of like a virus would do if it was attacking a cell, yeah. But at this stage you're just... At this stage we were focused on, yeah, uh, solid spherical particles mm -hmm. that we would attach to the surface, yeah. And then the second question, the, the masks that you had looked uh, rather large in, in the, in the yeah. nice photograph of the slide. Yeah, um, so that was a different research group with a, a, big, a big one that they'd achieved, yeah. But, but and then the purpose of the masks was to try and put l other functional groups on later, was it? Too? Yes, yeah. So other functional groups that you could then add to the free surface that was left. And then by adding a different, so different functional groups to that free surface, you can control the surface chemistry by putting, say, arranging the proteins that you want to put on. And so if you can arrange that, then you control how they interact inside the body. You can tell what kind of pathway it's going to take to get to exactly where you want it to go in the body to treat a disease or what, what have you, yeah. Good. Okay. yeah. Thank you, Adrian. Just a simple question. Uh, the corona, um, what natural particles or molecules in the body actually form that? The corona, yeah. So the thing, so when you put the nanoparticle in, inside uh, uh, the biological system, you get, obviously there's so many different things inside the, the blood essentially because you're administering these with IV kind of most of the time. Well, that was, that's the plan I think. But um, proteins, um, sugar molecules, um, sugar proteins, or something else. Proteins, um, Protein sugars. I've got it in a slide there. If you want, if I want to go back, but uh, actually, we'll get to the end of this. <laughs> we will. We will get to the end. Lipids. <laughs> so lipids are like fat cells, or yeah, fats. Yeah. Cool. 
Any any further questions? Oh, one more at the back. If we can just so just send the microphone down there. Are we going to see the video? <laughs> Are we going to see the video? I have the video if you want to see it. Yeah, if you haven't already seen, it. maybe at the end after. Yeah. If if we can arrange, we'll we'll try and get that sorted yeah. for the end. Thank you. Well worth. If not, you can go onto the website. I think they're still up there if you want to. Yeah. Anything else? In which case, then, I think uh, it's just left to, to thank Matthew once again. Uh, not only thank for you. The thank you for listening. Fabulous presentation, but also the video. Thank you. So now to our second speaker at this event, and this is Francis Vaughan, who's a PhD student at the Rowett Institute of Nutrition and Health at the University of Aberdeen. She's researching the mechanism by which heat-generating fat cells sense and respond to external temperature. And her research aims to identify molecules which could be manipulated to promote weight loss and potentially combat obesity. Now, in her free time, Francis runs the blog The Seasoned Student, which aims to promote and facilitate healthy eating amongst university students, which I think is <laughs> definitely in order. So I'd now like to invite Francis to tell us about the fat cell slim targeting adipocytes to treat obesity. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much to the RSC for this um, great opportunity to speak to you, and thank you to all of you for, for coming tonight. I hope that lots of you will stay behind for tea and coffee um, to talk further. Uh, despite my uh, topic for tonight, I hope I won't put you off the biscuits. Uh, having said that, <laughs> many of us will be familiar with this sentiment. In fact, the levels of obesity and associated diseases have now reached epidemic levels around the world. According to the World Health Organization, 39% of all adults are now overweight or obese. And in the UK, that figure rises to 62%. The classification of an individual's weight is based on a body mass index, or BMI, a number calculated by weight in kilograms divided by height in meters squared. A BMI of 18 to 25 is considered healthy, while overweight is ca classified as a BMI of 25 and above, and obesity as a BMI of 30 or over. In several countries around the world, for both men and women, the level of obesity is now over 50%. That is, the majority of adults are overweight or obese. The main factors thought to have driven this obesity epidemic is increases in national food supply, the widespread availability of energy-dense junk foods, and the adoption of sedentary lifestyles. As a major risk factor for type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, dementia, depression, osteoarthritis, and certain cancers, obesity poses a serious threat to public health. But as efforts to prevent and reverse obesity intensify, there's a growing appreciation of the complexity of body weight regulation. Body weight is governed by a balance between energy intake and energy expenditure. When weight remains stable, when calories consumed in the form of food and drink and calories absorbed from the digestive tract is equal to the number of calories used to fuel our organs, move our bodies and produce heat, a process called thermogenesis, to maintain an internal steady body temperature. Weight gain arises when energy intake exceeds energy expenditure and conversely, weight loss is achieved when energy expenditure chronically exceeds energy intake. While that might sound relatively simple, the regulation of energy intake and expenditure is highly complex, involving social, environmental, physiological, genetic and psychological factors. Our bodies are finely tuned to conserve energy, and as a result, simply eating less or exercising more often fails to achieve sustained weight loss over a period of time. This is 
because there are compensatory mechanisms which come into play in order to protect our body's energy stores. For example, um, when you exercise, there's a compensatory increase in appetite that drives us to replace the energy we've just used. Similarly, the number of calories needed each day actually drops as we lose weight. So in order to sustain weight loss achieved through a crash diet, people must continually eat less or exercise more in order to prevent regaining weight. So contrary to popular advertising, losing weight in a safe and sustainable way it can be really hard work. Clinicians and scientists are therefore searching for new ways to tip our energy balance towards weight loss and improved metabolic health. One area of growing research is in targeting the cells, called adipocytes, which store energy in the form of lipid droplets, otherwise known as fat. Unsurprisingly, these cells tend to get bad press. Adipocytes are found in clusters known as adipose tissue, probably the only organ which most humans would happily have removed. However, recent research has demonstrated that adipocytes actually play a key role in various physiological processes. This includes the regulation of blood sugar in our blood, the regulation of our appetite, as well as other processes like the inflammatory response, reproduction, and the regulation of blood pressure. Of these functions, there's growing interest in the production of heat by adipocytes through a process called non-shivering thermogenesis. This is because, as you'll remember from the previous slide, thermogenesis is a key contributor to energy expenditure. So it's thought that activating non-shivering thermogenesis may be a possible mechanism for promoting weight loss. I've spent the last year studying this process in the hope of identifying molecules which may act as therapeutic targets for the treatment of obesity. But in order to understand non-shivering thermogenesis, we must first take a closer look at fat. There are, in fact, three types of adipocytes, white, beige, and brown, each with a distinct developmental origin and unique functions. During embryonic development, Adipocytes derive from a subgroup of stem cells, which diverge to produce either white, beige, or brown cells. Recent evidence also suggests that brown adipocytes can de derive from muscle satellite cells in adulthood. White adipocytes are specifically adapted to store energy in the form of lipids. And so these cells are the adipocytes that make up white adipose tissue the tissue that expands as we gain weight. Brown adipocytes, on the other hand, are adapted to perform non-shivering thermogenesis, the process by which lipids and glucose are burned to produce heat. In small mammals and human babies, this is a critical process for maintaining a stable internal body temperature in cold environments. Brown adipocytes form clusters known as brown adipose tissue, and until recently, it was thought that humans lost this tissue as they developed through childhood. However, recent evidence suggests that a significant proportion of the adult population still have active, active brown adipose tissue, principally in the regions around the shoulder blades and the neck. Intriguingly, this third type of adipocytes, called beige cells, has also been identified. These cells are found within certain white and brown adipose depots, and as their name suggests, they're considered a hybrid between white and brown adipocytes. In the absence of stimulation, beige cells look and act largely like white adipocytes, storing energy in the form of lipids and not producing heat. However, following cold exposure and other physiological stimulators, beige adipocytes adopt a brown cell phenotype and produce heat via non-shivering thermogenesis. Thermogenesis is a key form of energy expenditure. This includes shivering thermogenesis mediated by the skeletal muscles and non-shivering thermogenesis mediated by adipocytes. 
shivering is a transient and relatively inefficient means of burning energy. It's also fairly impractical as a means of losing weight. <laughs> On the other hand, preliminary calculations suggest that activating non-shivering thermogenesis could increase energy expenditure sufficiently to promote weight loss and improve metabolic health. But how could we achieve this in a safe and sustainable way? Well, the most effective activator of non-shivering thermogenesis is cold. According to traditional understanding, cold sensing is communicated via the peripheral nervous system to thermosensory regions in the hypothalamus in the brain. Neurons in these regions then activate non-shivering thermogenesis in adipocytes via noradrenaline sing signaling in the sympathetic nervous system. Noradrenaline binds to beta-adrenergic receptors on the surface of brown and beige adipocytes. This induces a signaling cascade that results in increased expression and activation of a protein called uncoupling protein 1, or UCP1. This involves increased translation of the UCP1 gene into protein and increased activation of this protein by free fatty acids, which are produced by the breakdown of lipid droplets. UCP1 is responsible for uncoupling the electron transport chain in mitochondria. This means that the oxidation of glucose and lipids can no longer produce ATP, the energy currency of our cells. As a result, the energy released by substrate oxidation is lost as heat. So UCP1 is considered a key mediator of non-shivering thermogenesis because its uncoupling actions are essential for the production of heat. In theory, we could use cold exposure as a mechanism for promoting weight loss. However, unlike Elsa, most of us are so accustomed to warm conditions in our homes and working environments that cold exposure is generally considered a fairly unpleasant experience. Our aversion to cold usually drives us to perform heat-seeking activities, which prevent any increase in non-shivering thermogenesis. The challenge, therefore, is to devise a mechanism by which non-shivering thermogenesis could be activated without the sensation of cold. This would mean targeting this latter half of the cold signaling pathway, so avoiding signaling through the brain. Unfortunately, pharmacological activation of the sympathetic nervous system has significant cardiovascular side effects, and these would be particularly dangerous in obese patients. Amazingly, however, it's now believed that a subset of adipocytes can sense and respond to cold independently of the sympathetic nervous system. In 2013, scientists in Harvard demonstrated that mice lacking the beta-adrenergic receptors were still able to perform a cold response in certain adipose tissues. Probing this phenomenon further, they found that white and beige adipocytes cultured in vitro could produce a cold response autonomously. This was demonstrated by an increase in UCP1 expression and increased mitochondrial uncoupling. However, while the mechanism of indirect thermosensation via the brain is fairly well understood, the process of autonomous cold signaling in adipocytes remains uncharacterized. Understanding this pathway could highlight possible targets for the development of therapeutic treatments which would activate non-shivering thermogenesis as an anti-obesity treatment. <coughs> My research this year has aimed to characterize the process of direct cold signaling in isolated adipocytes. Our results suggest that the temperature-sensitive ion channels TRPA1 and TRPM8 may be responsible for mediating the thermal sensation in adipocytes. Furthermore, we showed that intracellular calcium signaling appears to play an important role in mediating this increase in UCP1 expression following cold exposure. These results were primarily achieved using a range of pharmacological activators and antagonists for temperature-sensitive channels 
and calcium signaling molecules. If you'd like to know any more about that, then please do ask. But still, despite our advances this year, much remains unknown about this process of autonomous cold signaling. For example, it's not clear how the UCP1 protein is activated in adipocytes following cold exposure. Similarly, it's not yet known whether this direct adipocyte thermos sensation actually occurs naturally in humans as well as mice. Given that some adipose tissues are relatively close to the surface of the skin, it's certainly conceivable that direct thermosensation plays a role in activating non-shivering thermogenesis. So going forward, these will be important questions to address. It's hoped that activating this process of non-shivering thermogenesis through autonomous cold sensing with pharmacological stimulators could burn up energy stores and therefore promote weight loss. This is a really exciting example of how understanding the chemical processes which occur within our cells could lead to the development of new treatments which would significantly improve human health. In the case of non-shivering thermogenesis, a number of issues remain to be resolved. For example, what would happen if we increase heat production by the body when we're not actually cold? Would the activation of non-shivering thermogenesis interfere with other functions of adipose tissue? And as with exercise and diet-induced weight loss, there may be compensatory mechanisms which prevent a significant weight loss following the pharmacological activation of non-shivering thermogenesis. This is where we need collaboration between chemists, neuroscientists, pharmacologists, physiologists and others to advance our understanding of non-shivering thermogenesis and its impact on body weight in the context of obesity. Clearly, there is more to an adipocyte than meets the eye. Chemistry has a critical role to play in understanding these complex cells in order to combat one of the world's greatest challenges today. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for that great presentation. Uh, I must say, I've never really liked the uh, BMI. I always seem to come in on the wrong side of it. <laughs> but, but perhaps now I've learned that uh, my muscle satellite cells are turning to brown adipocytes, so that, that's what I'm going with anyway. Um, but uh, have we got any questions? Uh, so I'll, I'll start off with one. Um, so where do you think this thing will be going? Do you think it will be actually a, a cream to apply onto the surface of the skin? Or do you think it will be ultimately maybe some, it will need to be taken uh, in the form of a pill or something? I mean, if, if you're able to stimulate these pathways. Yeah, I think um, for brown adipose tissue, um, it can be fairly deep. And certainly in, in adult humans, it's, it's deep within the neck and um, subclavicular regions. Um, and because skin, certain types of skin cell can sense temperature, and that's how the indirect cold sensing mechanism works. There'd be an issue of kind of crosstalk between those two pathways if you use a topical um, cream. So probably looking at a, a dipocyte specific uh, agonist or antagonist that you could take orally um, and that you'd be able to target perhaps using nanoparticles. <laughs> um, I can see a collaboration here um, to activate those beige or those brown adipocytes, um, yeah. But obviously, a range of things need to be addressed first. So one of the interesting but difficult issues with um, brown adipose tissue in humans is that it seems like there may be a decrease in the activity of brown adipose tissue with an increase in BMI, so it's a negative correlation. So potentially, one use of this non-shivering thermogenesis would be to, to prevent the development of obesity rather than completely reverse it. So before somebody's brown adipose tissue became you know, um, insensitive, uh, then you could use these stimulators to kind of boost their activity and so prevent someone from tipping over from, say, a BMI of 25 to 26 and into the overweight range. So that's an area that 
needs more work is actually calculating exactly what percentage of the adult population have active brown adipose tissue. Because if you just scan somebody once, which is what most studies will do, you may not get a positive result, but if you scan them five times, <coughs> you might end up seeing activity. So we need some more studies using a greater cohort, um, looking at more BMIs, looking at differences between ages, between genders, and um, before we can get a real sense of who would be the best group to target with these kind of treatments. Let's have a question at the front. Just... various populations of the world, of those who live in very cold climates and who would have obviously benefit a great deal from the uh, generation of heat, and those who live in very hot climates who would never have to have any use for that facility. Hmm. Um, some of the first papers to have, ident to have proven that adults still have brown adipose tissue looked at outdoor workers in Finland. Um, so people who are exposed to very cold environments, they showed that when you scan these people, um, you use a, a PET, a PET CT scan, um, to identify the tissue, then it was highly active in, in those people. It's only been about six years since we first discovered active brown adipose tissue in humans. I'm not aware of many cross-country comparisons, um, but that's certainly an area that would be really useful. One of the interesting things um, about the uh, kind of interaction between temperature and our body weight is it's not all just to do with non-shivering thermogenesis, but we, I'm sure many of you will experience this. A warm temperature or cold temperature actually affects our appetite for certain types of food. So you might expect that in Scotland everybody would be thinner because it's colder. But um, as some of you may know, that's not true. Um, and that's probably to do with the fact that, firstly, nowadays we're not really exposed to that cold. Um, but secondly, when you are cold, your brain tends to prefer foods that are energy dense, like sticky toffee pudding or roast dinner, stuff that you really would not want to eat if you're on holiday in Spain. Um, so when you're hot, your appetite tends to be suppressed. You want foods that are relatively light and refreshing. So actually, in warmer countries, you know, you've all heard of the benefits of the Mediterranean diet, I'm sure. In warmer countries tend to have slightly better metabolic profile than colder. So there's certainly more work that needs to be done to look at this interaction between um, appetite and non-shivering thermogenesis and looking at people from different countries would be a really important way of doing that. And a question at the front here. Can we have the microphone? Thank you. Thank you. Um, question about um, hypothermia. If brown adipose tissue is a relatively small proportion of body mass, does this mean you don't have to worry about thermal runaways if they do start doing a lot of thermogenesis? That would be, uh, yeah, an important thing to assess is to what extent activating um, brown adipose tissue in adults can increase the, the body temperature. So it's not yet clear exactly what role adult brown adipose tissue plays in normal um, regulation of, of body temperature. Um, it's clear that in babies it's, it's critical and that's largely due to the fact that they don't shiver. Um, so it's obviously quite difficult in adults to assess um, what I guess one thing you could do is, is find a group of adult humans who don't seem to have any active brown adipose tissue and then you could maybe compare their thermoregulatory mechanisms with people who do. Um, but it seems unlikely that you would cause major hy um, hypothermia issues. Somebody I, I heard talk about this said it would, might feel like you'd constantly just been for a run. So, you know, when you exercise, you can, your body can cope with that increase in, um, in, in temperature. You, you don't, um, it, that doesn't have a major detrimental effect. So um, that's definitely an area that would, would need a bit of work because cold is being... Um, being cold is unpleasant, but being too warm is also unpleasant, so you need to find that balance. Um, well, f firstly, thank you for making the lecture so accessible to the public audience. I think you did a really good job there. M my question, though, is about um, 
the absolute volumes of brown fat that are being, have been detected in humans. Um, is it present in a large enough volume for those who have it that it really could make a difference in terms of weight balance? Or is it there in very small quantities and that, um, obviously it's really important in rodents, but um, how about in people? So the f initial calculations um, suggest that if you maximally stimulate brown adipose tissue, it could burn up to 400 calories over the course of a day. So that's kind of equivalent to what you might eat for lunch. Um, so that could have a, you know, a major effect. Uh, most dietary interventions would suggest that you initially drop your calorie intake from 2,000 for a woman down to 1,500. So that's almost that's what you activating this non-shivering thermogenesis could achieve for you. Um, but one of the major questions that remains to be addressed is um, the contribution of these beige adipocytes. So we know that adults have adipose tissue that's thermogenically active, and so we call it brown adipose tissue, but actually when you sample it, some of the, some of the depots are just brown adipocytes, and some of them seem to be a mixture of beige and brown. And so that also raises the possibility that some of our white adipose tissues could also contain beige adipocytes that are um, that that you could recruit. So even if somebody's brown adipose tissue depots looked quite small in this region, you might have quite a large percentage of beige adipocytes in other fat regions around the body. Um, so going forward, that will be a difficult but important question to address. Um, yeah, it's, I, it's hard to see how you could sample all of somebody's fat cells, even if they were very willing to give them away. Um, so that's that's a question that w yeah we'll need some more some more work so that we can know how much of a metabolic impact this would have. Interestingly, from the rodent studies, it seems like even if activating non-shivering thermogenesis couldn't have a major weight loss effect, it does have a really significant effect on insulin sensitivity. Um, and some research suggests that the positive effects of gastric bypass surgery, which are currently really the only very successful means of achieving sustained weight loss, it seems that those effects might be achieved through the recruitment of non-shivering thermogenesis. And we don't know why gastric bypass would activate non-shivering thermogenesis. But that's kind of important evidence that activation of this process does have a significant effect on um, insulin sensitivity, which could be important for preventing type 2 diabetes and can produce weight loss. So, yeah, I think the future is bright. And uh, one, one quick question, and this is um, it's about your background. I mean, this was a sort of very biological presentation in many senses. I mean, are you at heart a chemist, or did, were you more of a, a, a biologist? Uh, and perhaps you can say something about the interplay between chemistry and the biology in your work. Yeah. Um, so my undergraduate at the University of Edinburgh was in neuroscience. Um, but a lot of our courses there were to do with the, you know, the, the neurochemical signaling um, as well as the, the, the biological function of neurons. So I think I would probably identify more as a biologist, but this has been a really um, great opportunity to see my research through a different lens and to, and to explore more that interaction and the role of collaboration between the disciplines. So at certain points throughout the year, I certainly fell out of my depth when it came to understanding um, the, the actions of UCP1. Um, I had to go back to my reading up on the TCA cycle and the electron transport chain, um, which I thought maybe I might have left behind in my A-level days. So, um, so actually, it's been a really great opportunity to develop my understanding of chemistry um, and, and a great to kind of appreciate, again, the, the interaction between all, all the different fields. So um, one of the interesting things about UCP1 is that we still don't quite understand how it achieves its uncoupling. Um, it acts as a proton channel, so you get this leak of protons across the inner mitochondrial membrane. But it's still not exactly clear how it's activated, how it responds to different environmental conditions. So um, if I've inspired any chemists here, then that's <laughs> a great project for you to take on. Well, oh, sorry. One, one last question then, I think. Yes, if I'm just... Uh... Just down the front here. Um, 
I just wondered, that I know Dr. Mike Evans did a lot of research on brown adipose tissue about 30 years ago and discovered that, that, that it, it did appear in adults. Has that been more or less neglected until now it's become important as a possibility of preventing obesity? Yeah, it seems like there, there was both the discovery of brown adipose tissue and of these beige adipocytes about 30 years ago. Um, but somehow a lot of those findings ended up being buried. Um, and I wasn't around at the time, so I'm not exactly sure why that happened. Um, but it wasn't until 2009 when they actually f rediscovered this brown adipose tissue accidentally. They were scanning patients um, for cancer tumors using this um, PET CT scan, which highlights uh, organs which are highly metabolically active. And they noticed this symmetrical spheres on either side of, of the neck and they realized that those weren't tumors and when you sampled them they were brown adipocytes um, and I think given that by 2009 the levels of obesity were now so significant um, relative to to the 80s that perhaps that just caught more attention um, you know there's really a desperate hunt for new means to reduce the levels of obesity so um, I uh, presume that that rediscovery um, just happened at the right time to, to catalyze this new wave of, of research. But it, I guess it goes to show that there may be lots of discoveries out there that have been made and buried and all it takes is somebody to probe a bit deeper and um, there may be new horizons ahead. Well, I think we should thank Francis once again for a fantastic presentation. In fact, thank both of our speakers.